Let's open our Bibles to the Gospel by John, chapter one, and in a few minutes, we're gonna get to uh, the first four verses. But as you turn there, what we're looking at this morning in our continuing uh, study, we, we started in 1 Timothy 4, we looked at the, the 10 disciplines that Paul was teaching to Timothy and saying that needed to be the, the conduit through which he would bless his church with their learning to train or discipline themselves for godliness. And we got to the center and we got to the the reflection of the Great Commission. These things command and teach. And Jesus said, go into all the world and teach them what I've commanded. And this concept of discipleship is at the heart of the church. It is really what all of us are called to be as making disciples. And one facet of that this morning is to understand who a disciple is. And a disciple succinctly is one who knows that Christ is the center of their life. See, for a disciple, Christ is the center of the disciple's life. And all of us, that, the instant of our salvation, that was true. Remember last week we looked at this old two-part salvation that you get saved and then someday you come to a place where Christ is Lord. No, that's actually how he does it instantaneously. It's just we resist and often allow our flesh to make ourselves to be central to our lives and it's all about me and not about Christ. But what I'm talking about this morning and I was thinking um, after the first service someone was talking to me and I was, they said, well, you know, what if these things aren't in my life? Does that mean I'm not a Christian? Well, have you ever been around someone that really knows their electronic device and they do something with it and you have the same one and you can't do that and you go over to them and you say, how did you do that? If you have that device, it does all of those things, even if you don't know how that functionality takes place. Did you know that when we were saved, everything I'm showing you this morning are all elements of what a true disciple of Jesus Christ has within the functionality of the Spirit of God living out through them? So many believers don't allow Christ at the center to radiate what we're talking about this morning. So let's, let's go through them. Each of us here today became Christ's disciple the moment of our salvation. And, uh, uh-oh, it's not up there. Oh, it is there, good. First service, they had to go back to nothing on the screen and people were falling out of their seats asleep all service. So I'm glad we have something to keep everybody. No, each of us today here became Christ's disciple the moment of our salvation. This is what... God did. Now, when you talk to someone and say, are you saved? If you hear them say, well, I did this, I did that, I did that, they baptized me, I walked forward, uh, I prayed this prayer. What I'm asking if I say, are you saved? Did God do this? Because at the instant of salvation, disciples are Christ's sheep. Disciples hear his voice. Disciples follow him. Followers are disciples. Disciples are believers. Believers are Christians. And Christians have been born again. They were born again the moment that they were saved. Now you notice I used all the words. They're all the same thing. This is a supernatural work God does in me. All I do is I just believe that Jesus Christ really loved me and gave himself for me and that I am lost and hopeless and a sinner and God miraculously makes me a new creation. And that new creation is instantaneously that Christ is the center of my life. But my choice following him is to keep living with Christ at the center of my life. Now the Apostle Paul put it this way. He said, in fact, Paul was asked uh, to give his testimony once, and he said, Christ is central to everything, and he says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ. Now that, you know, is Galatians 2.20. But Paul was explaining how he lived and walked and served like he did. And he said, it's this. He says, it's not me. It's Christ. When you see what's happening all over the world through, through my preaching, Paul said, it's not me, it's Christ. When you see me making it through all those jails and shipwrecks and stonings, it's not me. It's Christ living in me. And that's, it's not just in Paul, Christ wants to live. 
He wants to live out through each one of us. And that's why self-centered living is, is such a, a horrific area that, that, is, that it so limits God's work when we are self-centered instead of Christ-centered. And so the Apostle Paul explained the result of salvation. He said, it's not I but Christ. And then he talked about the method of salvation. He gave himself for me. And that's the essence of everything that we're celebrating at communion. And by the way, when we get to communion at the end of the service, and you hold the bread, and later you hold the cup, it is a re- affirmation that you and I are Christ's disciples, that it's no longer us who are living, but Christ, and that that process began when he gave himself for me. Did you know that's why the early church celebrated communion so often? Communion was when the early church gathered as Christ's body to declare that Christ was the center of their lives and that they were his disciples. And when we celebrate communion, we reaffirm Christ's death was in our place, his burial was with our sins, and his resurrection produced our endless life. So communion is when we reaffirm all that. And that's why the early church went from house to house, Acts 2 says, breaking bread together. It's very, very, very possible that those early believers loved to remember Christ's death in their place so much that they actually made a part of their celebrating and breaking bread together, the communion of his body and his blood. And that's why they were so focused. Because every time you celebrate communion, you reaffirm Christ is the center of everything. You know, when I was growing up in a normal, typical little Baptist church here in central Michigan, communion was served quarterly, four times a year, after the service for anybody that wanted to stay around. And I grew up thinking communion was not very important quarterly, and it was not something to invest your time in after the service while most people went to lunch. It was just a small little group that stayed around. And it was truly because they didn't understand the vital nature of the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Anytime that you and I have a chance to reaffirm our, our commitment to following Christ, being his disciple, that reaffirming that he died in our place and he is the center of our life, we should take it. It's more important than anything else and that's what the early church believed. Well. One thing that, that uh, and this week I, I spent the week going all the way through the four gospels, there's only 89 chapters in them, and I counted and looked at every time Christ talked about himself. Jesus spoke of himself as the source of everything very often. In fact, uh, by the way, I didn't have to count these manual. I have a program that does it, but Christ's words fill 1,958 word, or verses of the gospels. And in those 19, almost 2,000 verses, which make up the Gospels, Jesus calls himself by the first person pronoun 1,400 times. You know, that's like, have you ever met someone that almost every sentence they talk about themselves? That usually is, we don't like that. Jesus, in almost every sentence, refers to himself because Jesus is at the center of everything, of the life that he was sharing and so, Jesus was saying, I want you to listen to me. I want you to think about my words for you. And that's why our self-centeredness is so offensive to God. Life is not to be about us. Life is to be about Christ. And that's how Jesus presented it. You know, sometimes we've seen the me and mys and eyes so much in the Gospels, we don't, we don't, they don't jump out at us. Everything Christ promised was attached to himself. And that's why I said, apart from me, you can what? Do nothing. And so we need to affirm today, as we search the scriptures, to find out what it really means to be Christ-centered in everything. Jesus is the only key that unlocks the abundant life he promised, the overflowing life, the satisfied, the endless life. Jesus simply said, all of those things are in me. He said, I'm the key to everything and if we take the time to study what Jesus said in all these personal pronouns 1,438 times, we can almost summarize the doctrine of the entire New Testament. 
because what we see the apostles and the, those closely associated with the apostles like James and Jude and Luke writing for Paul and Mark writing for Peter, what we find is they, they follow and enlarge and amplify what Jesus, the, the Christ-centered life that Christ himself presented, they just amplify and explain. Well, John chapter one, Christ is the author of life and Christ is central to our spiritual lives because he is the one that created and sustains that life. He is the one who in John one, one to four says that he through his word as Jesus Christ is the source, the origination and the only supplier of life. If you have life today, it's not because some church baptized you, it's not because some ceremony was done or you prayed something, it's because Christ has authored that life. And he is the one that began and completes what he starts. And what he starts us as and what he wants to complete us as his disciples who know and follow him through life and do what he told us to do as we follow him through life. So John 1, 1 to 4, let's stand together for the reading of God's word. We're gonna read the first four verses and pray and listen to what this book opens with. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. And you could read all the way through and it, it talks about this life from there on. By the way, the, the book of John is the most amazing book. It opens with this, Jesus is the life. It closes with John 20, 31. These are written that you might believe Jesus is the Christ and that believing that you have life through his name, Jesus. Jesus, the author of life. Let's bow before him in prayer. Father, we, we want to hear your voice today. We live in a culture that has slowly deadened us to concentration on anything except loud sounds and fast moving pictures and action. And so it's very hard to concentrate and think deeply. But you are the one who wants to bring every one of our thoughts into captivity. And so I pray that you would amaze us today by reaching down to each heart that is crying out to you and saying, I wanna hear, I wanna understand, I wanna know, I wanna follow, I want, I want to grow, that you would captivate our thoughts to your obedience and that we would hear your voice through your word and that we would follow you more closely, more deeply and find you to be central to everything in our life because we respond in faith to you today. That's our request. Meet with us, we pray. And then may communion be a crescendo of each one of us here that know and love and follow you, reaffirming that it's not about us. It's about you. It's not I. It's Christ. And may we declare and by your grace live Christ-centered, lives. In your precious name we ask this. Amen. You may be seated as you're seated. Christ is truly the center of salvation. Remember I said that what he said in the Gospels just gets multiplied through the epistles. Let me just show you that as long as I told you that. Look at Romans chapter 11 and, and look at how the Apostle Paul in this great doxology refers to Christ uh, delivering up all things to the Father. And in Romans eleven thirty six, Paul says this, Jesus Christ is central because of him, Romans eleven thirty six, and through him and to him are all things to whom be the glory forever and ever, amen. That is how Paul reflects on Christ, making all things centered upon him as he delivers them up as 1 Corinthians 15 says to the Father. But Christ is the manifestation of the Father to us. If you've seen him, you've seen the Father. And so as we make Christ central in every part of our life, God is glorified as we, as I said two weeks ago, feel his weight and acknowledge who he is. So Paul 
says Christ is the center of salvation. Now look how he enlarges this a little bit later in Colossians chapter one. Keep going to the right. Colossians one, starting in verse 14. Because even more the centrality of Christ that he is to have in our lives is declared by Paul. And what he says in verse 14, in whom, this is in Christ, we have redemption through his blood. He is the one that redeemed us by shedding his blood. The forgiveness of sins. So central to everything is this purchase on the cross where Christ poured out his blood and purchased us by forgiving forever our sins. But look at what continues. Verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Verse 16, for by him all things were created that are in heaven, on earth, visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. All things were created through him, and look at the end of verse 16, and for him. You see that of him, through him, and to him from Romans. It's even being enlarged here. Uh, for him, and look at verse 17. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. Now he's applying it. Look at verse 18. And he is the head of the body of the church, that's us today, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Why? That in all things he might have the preeminence. Christ is central. And that is the essence of salvation. That's the essence of who is saved. Those to whom God has supernaturally, miraculously placed Christ at the very center of their being. We are new creations in Christ. That's why he talked about himself so much. And that's why people didn't take him up on his salvation. He was too attached to it. And they didn't like what he was saying. And they didn't want allegiance to him. And they didn't want to follow him. They didn't want to sacrifice for him. They didn't want to die like he said they had to. And they... Nowadays, we kind of distance a little bit what Christ said, and people kind of interested in salvation. But when you show them Christ and the cost and the demands, you know what? Salvation is absolutely free, but the maintenance will cost you everything, okay? That's what it's like. He demands utter centrality in our lives, and that's the message of salvation. Well, let's go back and see Jesus say this, starting back in John chapter one. And I'm gonna give you, when I used to be at Grace, um, I'm gonna give you what I used to hear John doing. He used to love doing these jet tours. I can remember his jet tour of Revelation. He did the whole book in one night. And he loved doing jet tours of things. Well, let's do a airplane tour uh, of uh, the Gospel by John. We won't jet all the way through, but in John chapter one and verse 18, I wanna show you this. What Christ does in the life of a disciple. Remember I said someone can have a digital device that can do stuff yours can't do? And it's in yours, you just don't know, you didn't know it was in there. Do you know if you're truly, and if I'm truly born from above, everything I'm talking about is what's in the operating system. And the more that we desire and surrender and invite and welcome Christ to rule and to and surrender to, to his desires in our life, the more he does all of these things. So with me, think through, how many of these are you really enjoying today in your life? Number one, Christ wants to explain the Father to us. Look at verse 18. Christ explains the Father to us. Jesus Christ is the one who knows, reveals, and explains God the Father to us. He says this in verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has exegeto, he has exegeted, he has explained. New King James says declared. Jesus explains God to us. Jesus takes the unapproachable dwelling in, in all of the fiery, like the writer of Hebrews says, our God is a consuming fire and no one can come into his presence. We can have him explained to us and be brought into his presence by Jesus Christ. So number one, what Christ does in the life of a disciple, he explains the Father to us. Number two, he brings all of God to us immeasurably. You say, what do you mean by that? Look at chapter three of the Gospel by John. And in verse 34, Christ brings all of God immeasurably to us. God does not come in pieces. Christ brings all his fullness to us. John three thirty four says this, for he whom God has sent speaks the word of God, for God does not give his spirit by measure. What he's saying there is, it's not like uh, you know, an IV drip, 
drip, drip. It's not like, by the way, that's what Roman Catholicism teaches, that every time you come to a means of grace in Roman Catholicism, they infuse and drip another little drip of grace. The Bible says, no, you get Christ, you got it all. You know, God does not give his spirit by measure. He doesn't say, okay, you get a quarter cup, come back, I'll give you a, you know, a half cup next time. No, you know, you get a teaspoon. He doesn't give it by measure. Of his fullness, John said in chapter one, have we all received grace upon grace? We get, in fact, that's really enlarged in Colossians. Paul says that the fullness of the Godhead bodily is in Christ. And if you have Christ, you have everything. So disciples have Christ bringing all of God immeasurably to us. Now look at this in chapter six. Turn over uh, 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 three chapters to chapter six, verse 35. Now this is the one event that's in all four gospels or one of the events. There there are a handful of events, about seven of them, that are in all of the gospels. They're big events. This is one of them. And it's the feeding of the 5,000. And look what verse 35 says. Christ offers us an always satisfied life. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. What he said is, at the very basic level, one of the things that all of us have experienced is hunger and thirst. And he says, those are things that you feel. And that emptiness and lacking and needing something, he said, if you come to me, I will give you a never-ending satisfaction in life. Why? Because the wicked are like the restless sea. They're insatiably never satisfied. They're going from one thing to another. They always want something else. They always want one more, a bigger, more of this, another experience. They're restless. They're not satisfied. They are not complete. They do not find Christ at the center, giving them the ever-satisfied life. Remember when Jesus uh, turned the water into wine and the, the steward said, you saved the best for the last? Did you know that's what the, the life of Christ is like? We have this always satisfied life and it doesn't end there. Keep going to chapter seven because the way this happens is in chapter seven, verse 38, Christ offers to us a spirit overflowing life. When we believe on him at that instant, rivers begin to flow from our lives. We aren't just given drips or sprays or puddles or stagnant pools or ponds. He offers us a life-giving river that will flow out of our life. And all he leaves us in charge of is making sure there aren't any obstacles to that river flowing out of our life. Because remember, you meet some people and their life is just spraying. And you look at them and you say, "Uh, mine's not working like that. You know what they say? It's in there. You're blocking it. Now, now look what Jesus says in verse 38. He who believes in me, that's every disciple, every true, born again, saved person, as the scripture has said, out of his heart. Everyone who is saved, born again, a disciple, a follower, a Christian, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. The Spirit's river of life-giving water flowing from us only can be blocked by sins, like our unforgiving spirits and resentments and bitterness and pride and dishonesty and sensuality and uncleanness. If we cling to our pet sins, the river stops flowing from us. And we don't feel like disciples and we don't act like disciples and no one can tell that we are his followers. But the original addition and what we can reset to by his grace is Christ offers us a spirit overflowing life. On to chapter 8, look at verse 12. Uh, Christ becomes to us a light-filled life. When we follow him, we'll never walk in the darkness again and be confused and lost and afraid. John 8, 12, then Jesus spoke to them and said, I'm the light of the world. Now look at this. He who follows me. Do you know, look at all the personal pronouns there. I You know, first it's Jesus speaking, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Jesus said, if you're following me, you're never in the dark. That comes with being a disciple. He goes on to say that he is the sin purger. 
uh, John 8, 24, just 12 verses down, Christ is central to our sin purged life. When we believed in him, he takes all of our sins so we won't die with any. Therefore I say to you that you will die in your sins, Jesus said in verse 24. If, for if you don't believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. In other words, all who believes that he is who he said he is, who become a believer, a follower, a disciple, a Christian, born again and saved, will never die with any sins on him. You know what sin, I think, uh, I have a, a, a phonographic mind. Did you know that? That means what I think about, I talk about, and I see it in my mind. And when I think about sin, I think of one of the horrors of, of warfare is when they used to allow the use of phosphorus bombs. Now, the United Nations has basically outlawed it. But once phosphorus sprays out burning and it touches someone, you can't put it out. You can get, jump in the water if you want. It keeps burning. You have to cut it out because it's just penetrating. It's horrific. You know what? Sin is just like that. If we realized how bad sin was, we wouldn't expose ourselves so readily to it because Jesus Christ is the key to the sin purge life. He's the only one that can scrape away sin because if it's not scraped away and we die in it, we forever are paying the price and burning. Part of the burning of hell is the, the, the burning, uh, fiery wrath of God that is, that is poured out on every sin. And, and people who die with their sin are covered with it. So God is focusing his wrath on that sin forever. That's why God is just in sending people to hell. He says, I'll take away all your sins. I will give you a sin purged life. They said, nope, nope, want mine. He says, but you know what's gonna do for you? Oh, doesn't matter, want it and they pay forever, absorbing his wrath. Well, he's also the start of our truth following life. Uh, if you look at verse 32 of John 8, when we abide in Christ's truth, the word of truth, we are his true disciples, we're truly liberated from life, from the stranglehold of sins, enslaving power. This is what a disciple is. You'll know the truth and the truth makes you free. Christ is the start of a truth following life and a truth following life is liberated, set free goes on. Boy, you can study the whole book of John. Christ is the center to our abundant life. Look at chapter 10. Turn over two chapters to verse 9. Christ is central. Disciples have an abundant life. Jesus said, I'm the door to a life that isn't just life. It's more abundant life. Verse 9. I'm the door. If anyone enters by me, no, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Verse 10, the thief doesn't come except to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. If you are following, if you're a disciple, I am central to you having this abundant life. It's part of the package. Let me unleash it into your life. We're supposed to be going through life with lives that people notice that we've been with Jesus. That's what went on in Acts. People noticed by the way they behaved that they were Christ-like. And that's what the Lord wants going on. If you look in chapter 11 and verse 25, Christ is the giver of our endless life. Jesus is the only access to life that is endless. Jesus said to her in verse 25, I am the resurrection life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. But look at verse 26. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. We have an endless life. Uh, we have a father seeing life in chapter 12. Uh, Jesus said in verse 26, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, the servant will be. And if anyone serves me, him my father will honor. And John 12, 45, he who sees me sees him who sent me. Jesus is crucial for us to see the Father. It's only through him. Uh, Jesus also is the key to experiencing God. In John 14, it, it's, it's amazing. If you look at John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him. We will come to him. And look at this, we'll make our home with him. You know, this weekend, there was a stellar home sale in Los Angeles, this mansion. Three billionaires were outbidding each other. And finally, one of them coughed up 102 million to buy this Versailles-like mansion. Well, immediately down the road, someone put theirs up for sale for 135 million because, you know, it made the neighborhood price go up. And people are talking now about the new one that's 135 because that's where Jacqueline and John Kennedy had their honeymoon. And boy, it's just really the place to live. And I thought, 
kind of makes our houses not seem so exciting until you realize, look what it says in verse 23. Christ is our, the key to us experiencing God. He will make his home with us. Did you know you can be in a Pakistani jail somewhere for blasphemy charges because you're a Christian and you can be more at home than in the $135 million monstrosity in Los Angeles and enjoy it more too. Because God, you're experiencing God at home. I mean, really, the more we experience this, the more we understand what heaven is like. Heaven is dwelling with God forever. And the reason some people aren't sure about it is because they're not in experiencing God now. If heaven seems distant, you don't have a Christ-centered life. Because if you have a Christ-centered life, you're experiencing God living with you. And you can't be the same when you understand what that means. Uh, a spirit and dwelt life, um, John 14, 26. Uh, the Father will send the Spirit in my name. Uh, Christ is the source of the, uh, well, in the prayer powered life, anything you ask in my name. I didn't even do that. That's John 14, 13, and 14. I skipped over that. And the love filled life by this shall all men know uh, you're my disciples. And also, John 15, 9 and 10 says, You'll abide in my love. Okay. And, and there are a lot more. I'm just, those are as many as I had time for. I wanted to get to this. So what happens? What does the life look like when Christ isn't at the center? Really, that's what we're supposed to think about at communion. Communion in 1 Corinthians 11 says, is a time we're supposed to examine ourselves. And we're supposed to sit in judgment against ourselves, hold up the word of God, look at our life and say, "Uh oh, I'm lacking in these areas. So just as an example this morning, when Christ is not the center, what are the symptoms of a self-focused, me but not Christ life. You know, a self-centered, self-focused person is saying it's about me, not Christ. Paul said it's not I but Christ. A self-focused person says, no, it's not Christ, it's me. And I'll, you know, give him a little time now and then, but it's all about me. And my whole life is, is geared toward what I can do, where I can go, what I can get, what I can be. And Paul said, that's not a disciple's life. So what are the symptoms of someone that's, that's not acting like a disciple who is self-focused and, and me, not Christ, is the center of their life? Well, I'll just go through these. If you, if you analyze, remember, the epistles take all these teachings and apply them and explain them and illustrate them. If you look at the epistles, what you find is if you have uh, usually only a marginal desire for God's word, in fact, you're virtually biblically illiterate, that's a sign of a me but not Christ kind of life. Because if Christ is the center of your life, then you want every word of God and you feed upon him and he's more necessary than your daily food. And, and you, wouldn't, you wouldn't go anywhere without eating from him because he's the bread of God come down from heaven. Here's another one. If you often walk in the flesh, and usually you don't even know the difference between walking in the flesh and walking in the spirit. That's an example of a self-focused life. That's not even on the radar. You don't even really think about what it means to walk in the spirit and walk in the flesh. If you have few, if any, works of grace in your life, there's no evidence of being filled with God's love to serve others. In fact, others are in the way. And, and if they're needy, you don't want to be around them. You don't want to give anything up. I mean, you worked hard to get that, and it's very hard. And a self-focused life is just few, if any, works of grace. And if you're usually stuck on the basics and there's no evident growth, it isn't like every time you, you come to the Lord, it's just like there's more that you want to surrender to him and more of him that you're realizing and you just get caught up with how great he is. If it's not that way, then the focus, the, the, the lens of your life is, is turned around. Have you ever... I, this happens to me all the time. I try and take a picture and I'm looking and staring at myself and I, you have to push that button to turn the camera to look that way. And you don't like it when it's like a mirror. You go, oh boy, turn that, you know. That's why we look in the Bible. We look in the mirror and if we see ourselves, we go, oh, that's not what we want. We want to see Christ. And that's an evidence of a self-focused life. 
If you have a limited desire for fellowship with other believers, in other words, you can just take it or leave it. I mean, church, I have enough of that for this month. If you have a strong desire for worldly possessions, I mean, you're just planning and figuring and calculating and protecting and and leveraging and maximizing. And if you're driven by selfish ambitions, all of your goals are somehow tied to yourself and finances and, and pleasure. And often you exhibit a spirit of competition. Isn't that interesting? Christians are mutually submissive and they walk in love and they're not push people out of the way kinds. And if they are, that's a symptom of self-focused living. If you often have great difficulty repenting and forgiving others when they sin against you, you have trouble of repenting of sins and you have trouble of forgiving people that repent and you hold and and there's people that, that you've held things against for days and weeks and months and years. That's a self-focused life. If you have a lack of compassion for the lost, you just see them as different or dangerous. You don't see them as lost and a trophy of God's grace if if the Lord will call them to himself. And you wanna be a tool to extend the gospel to them. And if you're not actively assisting in the spiritual development of others, you have a self-focused life because Jesus just left us with one thing to do, make disciples. He said, I'll build the church, you make disciples. And if, if we are not actively assisting in bringing people to Christ and teaching them to observe what he wants, we're not focused on Christ. If you have a limited sense of God, if his character, his will is not dominant, if you don't feel the weight of God, his glory in your life, if you have a life filled with fear, just fear everything, fear, you know, everything, and you're anxious, and there's an absence of peace, People don't go up to you and say, oh, you're just the most peaceful person I've ever seen. They go, what are you afraid of? How come you're so troubled? What are you anxious about? How come you have to take so many pills? You know, what's up with you? If there's an absence of peace, that's a symptom of a self-focused life. And if you're often covetous, you know what covetous is? You look over the fence, you go, I want that. I don't even want that, I want that. I want a bigger, better, I want that, I want that and boastful of what you have, and prideful and manipulative, always working to get something. And if you only have partial victories over sin, it seems like you just can't overcome those pet sins, they just grow. And if you have a non-existent or lackluster prayer life and little or more or no time in sincere God-centered worship, I mean, you like music, you don't even care about the words, it doesn't matter, you just, you aren't God-centered and focused on his character, Sam prayed, reverent in worship. If you're not really accountable to anyone for anything, I mean, they're not gonna tell me, what. I'm not gonna, you know, I, my life is an island. And if you have a very small degree of grace and mercy toward others or toward yourself, those are all symptoms, and there are many more, but those are just some of the symptoms from the epistles of the New Testament of what a self-focused me but not Christ life looks like. So back to why we're here. What's communion for? Communion is today for us to renew our pledge that it's not I but Christ. Look what Paul said in Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. All that self-centeredness was crucified with Christ. And when that happened, it was no longer I who lived. It was Christ living in me. And the life I want to live from the instant of my salvation on while I was in my flesh was by faith in the Son of God. The way I want to operate is the one who loved me and gave himself for me, I want to live for him. And the best way to live is let him live out through me. And the best way that happens is for me to renew. Actually, you know, when you really mess up your electronic devices, they always have this thing, restore to the original settings. You know, when you've just done too many things and it gets all confused, You restart it and reset it. You know, they even have little holes you can poke things in to reset, you know, when you even forget your password and everything. And and did you know at communion is when we bring our mixed up lives and we bring them for the Lord and say, "I I wanna reaffirm that you're Christ, the center of my life. And with Paul, I want to stay crucified with you, O Christ. No longer do I want to live for me. I don't want life to revolve around me, so I'm always hurt and resentful and 
and you know, dissatisfied and, and everything else. I wanna renew my surrendered life of following you. See, communion is where we come back to the beginning and get reset on what the reason is we're here and what the operating system is of our life. And the operating system is, it's not me, but I'm living for Christ. So that's our assignment as we prepare for communion. So let's all bow our heads and right where you sit, make this a time of surrender. If any of those symptoms of a self-focused life are present, just cry out to the Lord. And as the men go to prepare to serve us, let's just ask the Lord. I, I, just say, I, I want to reset back to being crucified with you, and I want to deny myself. I want to follow you, and I want you to live out through me. And I want to celebrate that at this communion. And Father, I pray you'd touch different areas of every heart that is in tune with you today. May each of us identify somewhere the flesh has crept in and I'm more concerned about me than you. And as soon as we identify that spot, we want to ask you to purge us and cleanse us of that sin. We want to confess it to you and forsake it right now. Because you've said we only partake of communion effectively with clean hands and purified hearts. So right now we confess that area of self-centered, self-focused, me first in our life. Maybe it robbed you of time in prayer or robbed you of time in the word or robbed you of us sharing the gospel this week because we weren't thinking about you but about ourselves. And we want to repent of that right now. And we want to reaffirm at this communion, it's not I but Christ. Just as a way of sealing that in your hearts with your eyes closed and heads bowed, just in this moment, breathe out to the Lord a cry. And from your heart, ask him to help you follow him throughout this day and this week. And be amazed as he changes your life. Father, thank you for this bread. It's a picture that you gave yourself to purchase us and took all of our sins as a part of the transaction, which liberates us for life to be your slaves. May we live that way for your glory today. In Jesus' name, amen. As the men pass the bread to us, we're gonna sing a beautiful song that the only hope to live this kind of an exchange life is in the Lord, who gave himself for me, that I should no longer live for myself. And let's sing this great old hymn. To stanza is, is the heart of our hope. We, it's not because we're good. No merit of my, my own, his anger to suppress. My only hope is just lodged in Christ. Let's read those words and then we'll jump in to the chorus. Just read the words. No merit of my own, his anger to suppress. My only hope is found in Jesus' righteousness. Here we go. Well, the scriptures say that when we gather for the celebration of communion, we take a piece of bread that represents Jesus Christ becoming sin for us. In his own body, on the tree, he became our sin. But what that reminds us is that that process of him dying in our place, and that he died for all, Paul said, that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but unto him, 2 Corinthians 5. That's what we're reminding ourselves at communion with this bread, that he died to purchase us to not live for ourselves anymore. And so this is actually a declaration. If you're partaking in communion, be very careful. The Lord said people that take part 
and aren't doing what they're declaring by taking part, he judges. Very negative. He says he weakens, sickens, and will even kill people who do not partake in a proper way. This is a partaking to say, I am surrendered, Christ is center, and by his grace, I'm living for him. Otherwise, you let the plate go by. I should have told you that before we served it, right? But now I got you in a pickle. <laughs> that means don't eat it if you're not surrendered. Jesus said, this is my body which I gave for you. Do this remembering me. Let's partake together. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that the cup follows the bread and the cup of blessing is the reminder that the blood of Jesus Christ, your son, O Father, cleanses us from all sins. Every one of our sins, the instant we were saved, is forgiven. You don't have to keep forgiving. You're faithful and just to already have forgiven us, but what we need is cleansing. And you only cleanse us when we agree with you that that area is sin in our life. So all we have to do is agree with you right now. And you have absolutely cleansed us from every sin that we have agreed with you about. And there is no obstacle to experiencing your marvelous, infinite, matchless grace once we've confessed and forsaken our sin. Thank you now for the cup that wonderful new covenant that you're gonna empower us to live this life as your disciple, following you, loving you, letting you overflow our lives. It's all because of the new covenant that's in your blood. Bless us as we worship you together and partake affirming that you are all to us, O Christ. In your precious name we pray, amen. As men come and pass the cup to us, let's stand and watch those trays as you're standing because we're going to sing out to the Lord and reaffirm our devotion to him through this wonderful hymn about the blood of Christ. This cup, the scriptures tell us, Jesus said, is the new covenant that is in his blood. When he shed his blood once and for all, he, he offered and opened to us the new covenant, which Ezekiel described. It was initially for Israel and still in the future and today when they call on him can be, but for us in the church, Jesus gave it to us and said, a new heart I gave you, a new spirit I put within you. I took away the non-responsive, hard, stony heart, and I put in a soft, responsive heart. And I will cause you to keep my commandments and do them. What is that? That's grace. That is God giving us the power, the, the longing. I call it the tow rope. We just, we say, I want your grace. And we hook on, he pulls us when we want that power. That's the new covenant that's in his blood. And Jesus said, remember it every time you partake. So let's partake together and remember him. And Lord Jesus, I pray that this would be a communion of Christ-centered disciples that by partaking today are affirming that it's no longer I, but Christ. And anytime I takes over, I want to repent and forsake, get cleansed, and get right back to not I, but Christ living through me. And that's our prayer in the precious name of Jesus and for his glory, we ask it. And all of God's people said, amen. And God bless you as you go.